welcome to Think 16. So who's been here before? Let me see a show of hands. Oh, I love this. I love it. Has anyone here been to every single thing since 2008? I'll share. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, we obviously have some loyal thinkers here. And thank you for joining us at the lovely Hotel Del Coronado, our ninth annual Think Conference. Who likes this hotel? I feel, I feel actually honored that you're here and not out there. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So we know you're here for a good reason, and it's the reason why we started Think in the first place. So back in 2008, we thought it was time to disrupt business as usual. We wanted to find new ideas and insights that would help us to compete with the big banks and the growing financial technology industry, what we now call FinTech, so lovingly. So we expanded our annual shareholders meeting, and we wanted to give you the time and the space to focus on the future of the credit union movement. That's what Think does for us. That's what it does for me. It gives us the opportunity to turn our attention from where we've been to where we want to go. Remember that old Apple tagline, think different? Well, we've been thinking that way from the start. In fact, we invited Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak to our very first Think conference in Palm Desert. Since then, we've been hearing speakers and representing speakers from brands from A to Z, from Apple to Zappos. And at Think, we want to expand our vision. That's why every year we look for new inspiration beyond our movement. There's a great quote from Simon Sinek that some of you may know, and it captures really what I'm talking about here. Curiosity is essential for progress. Only when we look to worlds beyond our own can we really know if there's room for improvement. And I really passionately believe in that. Curiosity, looking beyond, finding room for improvement. That's what Think's all about. And we've taken Think all over the country. We wanted to bring it to as many credit unions as possible, and you all are scattered everywhere, from the desert to the mountains to the big cities, we paraded in New Orleans. We've gone to Disneyland. We even learned how to get to Mars from Dr. Jeff Norris of JPL. That was a fun one. And along the way, I believe that Think has helped us redefine who we are as a movement. I hope it has, and it certainly has helped me think differently about what we can be. We've tried hard to make Think grow in response to you. Think, that has led us to think of things that have never been done before in the credit union movement. For example, we reimagined the panel discussion. I don't know if you remember this one. We invited you to engage with our guest speakers on topics that are relevant to credit unions. So the picture that you see up here is one of my favorites. It's the first Think It Out mashup. And only at Think would you see Sir Ken Robinson of TED Talk fame and skateboard legend Tony Hawk geeking out about credit unions with Mark Meyer and Bill Cheney. That was one of my favorite Think moments. And that's what's made Think so fun over the years. It's a live event where we encourage, really demand, your participation. And this year is not going to be any different, so get ready. Think is an ongoing conversation. It's a social dialogue with interactive sessions and, of course, the Think app. I've seen a lot of you participating. John Barnfather. <laughs> Every year. <laughs> we trended on Twitter. We even streamed a music show around the world right from Think. And every year, we've pushed the envelope to make things interesting for us, but to really ensure that we're learning and growing and progressing in our movement. We've literally made Think a stage to debate the future of direction of the credit union movement. As we heard in the opening, when divergent thinkers converge, innovative ideas emerge. So yeah, I guess we we're kind of proud of what we've done with Think, which brings us to Think 16. So let's start the conversation again. Let's frame that conversation around one basic question. What does people helping people mean today? People helping people, it's a slogan, it's a phrase, it rolls off the tongue. I hear you all talking about it every day. 
we know it, we live it, helping people in their financial lives has always been the defining purpose of the credit union movement. But what does it mean to help people today in 2016? How do we help people in their financial lives? So to answer that question, I think a good place to start is with people themselves. Where are their heads at? What are they thinking? And every indication is that people, maybe what we used to call the broad middle class, they're thinking a lot about how to make ends meet. And they might be feeling a little stressed about it. Of course, since the crash of 2008, we have seen the economy improve. And unemployment is down, stocks are up, the big short is long gone. For credit union members, the numbers also look pretty good. Compared to non-members, credit union members have more college degrees. They are likely to have full-time employment. Even 75% of them own a home. So, improving the overall economy. Yay, credit union members. Happy credit union membership. So everything is good, right? Well, that's what the numbers tell us. But people aren't numbers, are they? That's what you all tell me. So traditionally, when we've set out to help people in their financial lives, we made it our purpose to help them get ahead. Today, many people are just trying to hold on and not fall behind. People are anxious about helping to make ends meet. That's what the data tells us. They'd love to get ahead, but it doesn't seem possible. And in this election year, this is what we've heard from many of the proposed reasons about why people are feeling stressed in their financial lives. Left and right. Wall Street is driving economic inequality. Jobs have been pushed out of the country. And so on and so on. Some observers cite other reasons that might feel a little bit closer to home. They say that wage growth hasn't kept up with gains in productivity, and others blame rising consumer debt. So people are spending, spending more and saving less. We wish it was the other way around. And it's easy to see why things don't, don't add up. So we saw this cover recently, uh, this cover story by uh, Neil Gabler. That does an, he does an interesting job of summarizing what life is like for many middle-class Americans who are living in a state of financial confusion, so to speak. He was struck by a f statistics uh, from the Federal Reserve Board. They, this, they did a survey that asked respondents how they would pay $400 in case of an emergency. $400. 47% said they would have to borrow or sell something to get that, 47, that uh, $400. Gabler reveals, the author, that he is one of the 47%. Did anybody read this article? It's a great article. It's actually that Atlantic is in the gift shop. I encourage you to go read it. So he couldn't come up with the $400 either. But wait, he has a house in the Hamptons. He's a successful writer. Still, despite appearances, he confesses that he is financially illiterate. And I think we've all heard this story in one way or another. You could be fully employed, but still be falling behind on the bills. You could be sending your kid to college and realize that you're piling up this incredible debt on the, this education that is costing more and more and more every year. But you're doing everything right, but financially, everything's going wrong. And you can't understand why. So maybe it's a lack of financial understanding that's causing so many people to feel anxious. They're confused, they're uncertain, and they don't know how to get help. Think about that. Meanwhile, on the other side, we've also observed another trend that seems to be increasing the tension out there. And it has to do with the digital transformation of our economy. I would say that's probably the digital transformation of the whole world. <laughs> Uh, but digital transformation is certainly a well-known topic for those of us in the financial services industry. I believe we've touched on it just a few times here at Think, but we've definitely talked about it last year in Colorado. And we even had a new word for it. Does anybody remember the word? All right, you don't remember that far back. It was, it was a year ago. Ubitech, the ubiquity of technology. Whatever you call it, 
Digital transformation impacts everyone, everywhere. And we are certainly tuned into that at Co-op, where FinTech is something that we concentrate on every day. And obviously, as consumers, we've all benefited from the customization, convenience, personalization, connection that digital services created. But there's another side to this story. Our friends at McKinsey call it a tale of the digital haves and the digital have-mores. The have-mores are the high-skilled workers in the tech-driven companies who uh, employ them. For the digital have-mores, these are pretty darn good times. They're, they're like riding, they're good. And they are leading the digital transformation. But for anyone trying to keep up with this transformation, things like cash flow and monthly financial slack, these are ongoing challenges. And these are things that you're probably hearing in your credit union. So McKinsey says that we're in a time of transition and churn. In other words, for many people, these are pretty anxious times. We think the credit union movement has an important role in addressing the needs of people in this time of transition. And every period of transition is also a time for potential evolution. And evolution requires adaptation. So our purpose is more relevant than ever. We should have a sense of urgency about this idea of people helping people. We can help people adapt in this time of transition and transformation. As the lone financial services provider dedicated to help people in their financial lives, we need to be a positive force in reducing fear, in showing possibility. We need to focus on helping people gain more understanding, more certainty, more security about their financial issues across the economic spectrum. So how can we help people today? Right here in 2016. So at Co-op, we put a lot of thought into this. The Think team has been really thinking about this. And we think we have an idea how. We're gonna share it with you. And the formula is pretty simple. Purpose plus innovation equals opportunity. Purpose plus innovation equals opportunity. For the credit union movement, delivering on our purpose means embracing innovation that's born from human-centered needs. Human-centered needs. That's why innovation is such an important part of the equation. First of all, we see innovation as a way of harnessing power of that tidal wave of the digital transformation I just mentioned. When you inject purpose into digitization, magic happens. And we really feel that that's our opportunity. As a movement, we can't just settle for being one of the digital haves or even the have-mores. We need to strive to be the digital have-most, and I think we can do it. That requires a spirit of innovation that runs through this entire movement. Innovation can be a differentiator for us. It can be a market-leading opportunity for us. At Think, You've seen, we've seen countless examples of successful businesses that have anticipated trends and capitalized on them through digital innovation. Let's think about how we can deliver the best digital solutions that people expect and demand. So for example, how can we embrace digital media and speak to people where they live? You might hear a little bit more about this today with our, speaking, with our speaker lineup. Let's think about that. How easy is it for a person to join your credit union? How many steps does it take? Is it enough steps to count on a Fitbit? I would say that might be too many steps, even though that's good, like we're logging that, that's good. So could it be as easy as getting an Uber to the airport? Actually, maybe it could. To reach the people we need to help, we need to think through our digital delivery channels. We need to get ahead of our fintech competitors or they will get there first, and we've been seeing that. And I know that innovation can be difficult sometimes for us. We're in a highly regulated industry, very highly regulated industry. And because we're so mindful of our members' accounts and our members' well-being, we tend to act very conservatively, which has really helped us weather a lot of things. And we need to embrace that and still go with it. But we need to find reasons to stop 
finding reasons to say no, and we need to find reasons to say yes. And through innovation, through innovative thinking, we can say yes. Because when we talk about innovation, we're really talking about a, a positive mindset. And for those of you that know me, I'm like a complete Pollyanna. So hang with me for a minute. <laughs> we should always look to help people in the smartest ways with the best digital tools available. And I passionately believe by combining purpose and innovation, this movement continues to gain a new opportunity to differentiate ourselves and grow and make our movement really stand apart from every other kind of financial services out there. I know it because, I know it can be done because we already see a lot of companies demonstrating this. They're demonstrating the benefits of purpose and innovation. So, we've prepared a short documentary that showcases the benefits of being purpose-driven. It was created for a broad audience and features insights from our, from our friend Perry Yateman of Mission Measurement and some additional comments from yours truly, so go easy on me. So let's take a look and I'll be back after the video for a couple short final thoughts. When you think about purpose plus innovation equaling opportunity, I think it's worth going back a little bit to think about the history and where we've come from in terms of business. My name is Perry Yateman, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about something that I am personally really passionate about, the intersection between business and society. A hundred years ago, most businesses actually were founded on the principle of trying to solve a social issue. It was a stakeholder model. You cared about everybody that it took for you to be successful. So your employees mattered, your supply chain mattered, your communities mattered. But we really shifted more to what I think of as a shareholder mindset. To quote Milton Freeman, that the business of business was business. Companies, when they addressed these things, they did it because they felt they had to. They did it through foundations. They did it through giving and philanthropy. It was a sideline on the business. It was never the core. And that's been completely uh, proven to be a mistake. The data is very clear that in every industry, consumers are voting with their wallets and going places where they can see that if it's the same price, quality, value, they are always going to pick the one that they feel is more socially responsible. Tom's, for example, they're the innovator of the one-for-one -one model. When they started about 10 years ago, did we really need another shoe company? I don't think so. That really wasn't the problem. But what made them different and what has made them successful is that they created not just a good product at a reasonable price that was fashion forward and comfortable, but they actually created a business model where every single time a consumer bought a pair of Tom's shoes, somebody who didn't have a pair of shoes benefited. That, I believe, is the absolute reason that that company has been successful and has grown exponentially over the past decade. If you look at Unilever, for example, I love Unilever, and, and Paul Pullman today is absolutely the poster child for big companies looking at trying to drive growth through social innovation. And when I say social innovation, let me be clear. What I'm really talking about is where you combine a very clear business need, business objective, with a clear social imperative. He has bet the $60 billion, 100 plus year history of that company on a sustainable growth plan. Why is Unilever beating P&G today when they've been rivals for 100 years? People will tell you it's about the mission. It's about the fact that Unilever has made it so clear that they want to double their business and half their footprint, half their negative impact in the world by 2020. But it's in their DNA. When Unilever was founded by Lord Lever, um, bar soap came to being because he was actually trying to reduce cholera in Victorian England. So the entire company was actually founded trying to solve a social issue. But they didn't stop there. They were one of the first companies in the world to create an entire village for their workers. It was called Port Sunlight. They provided housing, they provided education, they provided health care. Their view was if our workers are healthy and educated, then they are going to do better. So they saw it as a productivity move and also a social responsibility. I think that is a great way to think about it. 
everybody's trying to figure out how do we get more millennials, how do we work with millennials, how do we make them productive? And the bottom line is they're telling us the answer. The answer is they want to work for organizations that have meaning. Uh, they want to feel that they're making a positive difference in the world by the work that they do. And if we can't offer that, they're not interested in working with us. Today, Unilever, if you look at the surveys, they are now the second most desired employer in North America behind like Google. They are now more desired. People are more motivated. Their employees are more productive. Uh, they have a lineup of people who want to work for Unilever now. And I bet that they will be around for another 100 years because of doing this. Business is the single driving force for social good in the world. It has lifted more millions of people out of poverty than anything else. It is sustainable, scalable, and replicable, but it has to be done right. It has to be baked into the mission. You need to look at your consumers. You need to look at what is the social need that you could deliver in a lot of companies that are doing this well, whether that be Unilever or whether that be Tom's or I would argue credit unions. People Helping People has been the foundation of the credit union movement for 100 years. A credit union is a type of financial provider that is about people, not profits. I'm Samantha Paxson, and I work at Co-op Financial Services. Co-op is a financial technology company that serves credit unions across the country. We give them access to ATMs, and we connect their branches together. We give them financial tools like apps and mobile banking and digital services and credit and debit card services. We serve about 3,500 financial institutions and about 60 million consumers. Credit unions are local. They're focused on um, a particular type of community. There are credit unions that serve the LBGT community. There's a pot growers community credit union. There's a kind of credit union for everyone. The credit unions like to say we're the best deal in town. But I like to say, why are they the best deal in town? because they care about you. They want to make sure that people do not get caught in a financial product that would harm them, even though it would make money for the financial institution. Who would have thought an old world company, like credit unions, right? It's an old company, it's an old model. There is a lot of tradition there, but they are now sexy. People are hungry for this kind of financial services provider. They are starving for it. If being purpose-driven is good for our bottom line, great. It truly is not only good for people, but it's good for business. And that's okay. That's okay for us to say that as an industry. We wanna grow. We wanna have the opportunity to be providing more impact. We stumbled upon Yubi as a really fun startup under two years old. UB is a super cool, awesome school supply company. We thought, you know, if you make these school supplies really colorful, exciting, and engaging, the kids are gonna want to use them, and that creates an investment uh, between the kid and their own education. For every school supply that you buy, we donate a school supply to classrooms in need right here in the US. UB launched uh, just over a year and a half ago, and in that time, we have donated free school supplies to about 1.4 million kids in large part because of our social impact. We launched nationwide in every single Target store across the country. And I think that that model is really repeatable. I mean, any company can really do this. I thought you have to make a decision between making a lot of money and doing a lot of good. You don't have to make that decision. You will make more money by doing more good. Looking at Grayston Bakery, they're this little bakery in Yonkers. Our founder, Bernie Glassman, had a vision of really combining business with social justice. His ideas are almost more on point than they were 33 years ago when he started them. We're most well known for actually making brownies for Ben & Jerry's ice cream. When we think about the business of Grayston, we don't really think about the business of Grayston being brownies. The business of Grayston is about open hiring and innovating on our social justice model. There's no background checks, there's no interview, there's no reference checks. We are really most concerned about people's productivity in the future. We have no interest in what they've done in the past. When I can talk to customers about more than just the product, it's an incredible competitive advantage. 
Because they're purpose-driven, their products are now being provided at scale across the world. Greystone and Tom's, I love the fact that one of the things they describe is they're actually a mission. They needed a company in order to deliver the mission. You know, I think it's almost an unprecedented opportunity for credit unions. I mean, the time could never be better when you have two things intersecting so beautifully. One is the financial industry as a whole has never been more hated. Nobody wants to go there if they don't have to. Um, and simultaneously, you've got this trend back towards really caring about purpose and about mission. It is rare in history that you're gonna get two things combining so clearly so that you actually have a benefit against competition and you've got a consumer base that is primed and telling you it wants this. We have just gone through one of the worst economic periods in our most recent history. Credit unions have really been the place that people can go where they know they're not gonna get taken advantage of. It is not about making money access to capital in ways that is affordable um, and that is practical for these uh, individuals, it's a huge part of the answer for them to finally break the cycle of poverty. Then people actually have money to invest in other things. It is a win-win-win. I'm just shocked that more people don't actually use credit unions. And in fact, I would ask the reverse question, which is, what is it that is holding credit unions back? We're authentically positioned to help people in their lives. People should understand that they not only get a better banking product, but they actually are banking on themselves. They're banking on their friends and their community. We can be an industry of intrapreneurs. We can look inside our industry and think like a startup inside a hundred year old business. And that is to me uh, kind of the epitome of looking at something where you take innovation and purpose and it creates opportunity. Okay, who's fired up from that? You guys are amazing. This movement is amazing. So what did we learn? For me, there are two big takeaways from what we just saw and heard. First, purpose is why we do business. It is why we do business. And as we heard, it should be baked into everything we do. And secondly, being purpose-driven is a profitable way of doing business. Purpose gives us the platform for action. It's our vehicle. And innovation is the engine that makes it go. So let's look at that equation again. Helping people is our purpose. It's why we exist. Innovation through creative problem solving is how we do it, it's how we get there. Out of that combination of why and how we get the opportunity, that's some of our equation. By positioning ourselves as being truly a purpose-driven movement, which we are, we authentically are, we are not limited to what came before. As innovative thinkers, we have infinite possibility, infinite, unlimited opportunity. I mean, did you see how many smiling faces were in that video? <laughs> yes, mine included. Uh, but that's because when you embrace purpose and innovation, it is actually really super fun. And that's why I've loved working in this industry for the past 12 years. And that's because you're always in a process of discovery. It's exciting, it's real, and people are great. But what's in it for us? What do we get out of that? And I would say that knowing that our work has a positive impact on the lives of real people, and knowing how to achieve that purpose in creative, exciting, and new ways. That is exciting. All of that adds up to a for a reason to get up in the morning and feel good about what we're doing every day. Because remember, the credit union brand, People Helping People, is a solid, solid space in the market. It is our point of differentiation. It's something to believe in. It's not just a slogan. People have to see and feel that benefit. They have to see that in every way that you deliver a credit union movement kind of experience. So today, with many people feeling stress and even fear in their financial lives, giving people confidence can make all the difference. 
We know that consumers who are confident in their financial services provider looks out, that looks out for, being, for their well-being will be much more engaged with that provider. And who best to be that provider? You guys should all know the answer. You are. You are the best kind of financial provider in the world today. You are the gifted and talented change makers of the credit union movement. That's what we like to say about people that come to think. You are the gifted and talented. You come from all over the country. You are turned on, your minds are on, you're ready to rock. You have the most insights about what works in your community. And you are the ones who can best engage the people that our movement is so desperately trying to engage and serve and help. So purpose-driven engagement is good for our members and it's good for you. So are we cool? Are we good? Are we ready? As we say here in Southern California, I'm pretty stoked to be here. You gotta pick up the lingo in good old California, so let's get started.